good morning to all our viewers today and a good evening to Dr. Rashish Gupta, who's in US West Coast right now. Welcome everybody to our second lecture of the Centenary Lecture Series from Punjab Engineering College. I'm Divya Bansu, currently the Dean of Alumni in International Relations and also Professor of Computer Science at PEC. Our Centenary Lecture Series features eminent personalities and unique voices from across the globe who shared invaluable experiences and vast knowledge accumulated over their lifetime with us. We promise you an enriching experience to gain insight into its spectrum of knowledge. As PIC celebrates its centenary year, we bring to you our guest speaker of today, Dr. Ashish Gupta, who founded an e-commerce firm in 1996 called Junkly, one of the most successful startups and holds PhD in computer science from Stanford University and a bachelor's degree from IIT Kanpur. I'm very pleased to welcome you, Dr. Ashish Gupta. Before we move on, I would like to introduce you to our own alum, Hardik Batra, who will be your host today. He graduated in electronics and communication engineering in the year 2014 from Punjab Engineering College and was also awarded the Institute Color. He later went to receive his MBA from Indian School of Business. Hardik is commercial director for Food Panda Philippines. And before Food Panda, Hardik was a part of Zomato's global growth team and was responsible for international expansion of Zomato Gold across Southeast Asia. Now, I would like to request Hardik to formally welcome and introduce Dr. Ashish Gupta to all our viewers. Over to you, Hardik. Thank you. Thank you, Divya. It's a pleasure to be here and quite an honor to be moderating this session with Ashish. Uh, when I was doing my research on Ashish and one thing I'm quite clear that this man needs no introduction because whatever I will say will probably fall short of capturing plethora of achievements. But let me try. Graduating from IIT Kanpur in computer science engineering, where he was the recipient of President of India gold medal, he went on to receive his PhD from Stanford. And recently, IIT Kanpur also conferred him with the Distinguished Alumnus Award. Dr. Gupta's entrepreneurial journey began somewhere around 1996, where he co-founded Jungli. Now this everybody is aware, but I think what people do not know is that why it was named Jungli. And I think it has quite an interesting anecdote and I will expect Ashish to rather reveal more details. But Jungli was later on acquired by Amazon for a whooping amount of $230 million in 1998. Then, Dr. Gupta also co-founded another pioneering company, Tevent, which now has 3,000 employees. And as we all know, he also co-founded venture capital fund, Helion Ventures. But apart from that, he has also seen successful investments in some of the leading Indian unicorns like Flipkart, Make My Trip, New Sigma, Daksh. And a lot of people whom I have heard talking about Ashish, they revere him as a man with a Meta's touch. He also serves on several boards, including EasyTap, Simply Learn, SMS Gupshop, and Nokri. I can go on and on, but I think without further ado, I'll hand it over to Ashish and will request him to please take it over from here. Welcome, Ashish. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me. And uh, I look forward to sharing some thoughts. I, my request would be that feel free to pose questions and uh, interrupt. And I mean that constructively, there is absolutely no uh, negative connotation to that. As you have questions, please share them uh, with Hardik and uh, he'll pass them on as the a single point of screening and contact. And the more we can make this a conversation, the more fun it will be for, uh, for me and for all of you. Uh, so let's, uh, let's get started. Uh, could could uh, somebody enable me to share the screen, please? I'm sorry, I should have asked for this before. I did not check. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, okay. Let's get this whiteboard out of the way. Well, I don't know how to get the whiteboard out of the way. Okay, here we go. Uh, so is my screen visible, Hardik? We can still see a white screen though. Oh, interesting. Okay, so that means I've done something wrong. Technology is clearly not, uh, all the degrees in computer science have been wasted. Uh, 
is this any better yes we okay good. okay so uh this kind of captures the sentiment that was knocking around in my head when uh, dheera suggested that uh, that i should uh, talk to some of you that all the experiences that that i've gathered uh, they all kind of translate into stories but often with no points and so i hope that uh, there will be some point at the end of this and uh, feel free to press me to figure that out as uh, as we go on so what i want to talk about is some thoughts or some lessons that i have learned about how to increase the odds of success or satisfaction and there are lots of vague terms in this and as we go forward uh, we'll try and uh, break them apart uh, just some background hardik gave you some and there is some context for this background uh, so my dad is from the armed forces so as a result bounced around uh, several parts of the country uh just for context i was in kanpur between 84 to 88 uh, the color tv was in 1982 uh, to just kind of date how ancient all of this is uh then went to stanford from 88 to 94 the first web browser which is mosaic and the commercial internet uh, came live in 1993 uh, while i was still a student and soon after graduating uh, uh, encountered the web I spent a couple of years in large companies like IBM and Oracle and then given that the web was all of 3 years old and uh, Yahoo had come out of Stanford and uh, Hardik to your point the reason we named Jungli Jungli was because Yahoo had been created by a couple of guys who used to be in the same uh, dorm that I used to live in and we all kind of uh, knew each other and shami kapoor song from jungle in which he is screaming yahoo uh, was something that caught the attention of one of our investors who was a japanese gentleman and he liked the song so much that he said hey you got to uh, name the company for the movie in which yahoo is merely a song uh, so this will be the the mother of yahoo so to speak and that was the genesis of jungle and uh, jungle lasted 2 years and was acquired by amazon Uh, but i am not very capable of working at large companies despite that have been that was a fantastic opportunity so i left and started another company and also did a kaufman fellowship which was a way to learn about venture capital and helion was for the last 14 years and we've invested about 600 million dollars and i'm sharing some of this history because that will color the the commentary that i will i will make so please treat this as the set of biases that i come from Uh, or that I come with. Uh, for context, by the way, smartphones are all of a dozen years old. They feel like they've been around forever. Uh, but the first iPhone came in two thousand seven, and in two thousand ten, if you looked at India, there was hardly any data connectivity, which today pretty much all of us take for granted. So, data connectivity in India is less than a decade old, um, in any meaningful manner. Okay. And Hardik, if there are any questions, let me know. I can't see the chat window, so you'll have to interrupt me. Uh, all of this full screen mode uh, prohibits me from seeing the chat window. So sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. I'll pitch in. Ji. So India today, which is where most of us are working and growing up, is in the middle of a huge inflection, and uh, you all are all witness to it and driving most of it as young people. Uh, aspirations are high standard of living is increasing and then there are massive unsolved problems alongside and they cut across everything whether it is banking whether it is inclusion whether it is uh, brands you name it and uh, just the fact that our per capita income is uh, a significant fraction of the per capita income of many 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 other parts of the world tells you that there are lots of problems that have to be solved and some of which by the way are better left unsolved uh, and we'll get into that also there's a lot of investment flowing into the country because people believe that uh, this is the largest uh, democracy in the world and therefore it is worth investing in and china is now out of favor so uh, india is the last place where people can hope to invest money given that the rising standard of living will cause their money to multiply 
uh, independent of how poorly uh, the country is run or companies are run. And there are lots of opportunities. Along with opportunities also comes room for both satisfaction and success, but also frustration. When somebody's hopes are raised and not met, there is even more frustration than when the hopes were not raised up at all. Uh, so this is going to be a recipe for both uh, achieving success and satisfaction, but also frustration. So I'm hoping that a few of the tools that I first simplify the title, which is how can they increase the odds of my satisfaction? And you'll notice I've gotten rid of the word success. And this is not because success is not important. In fact, most of us think of success, but success is what other people think. And satisfaction is what you feel internally. And it is satisfaction that one has to shoot for and success will follow. If you are going down a path where you feel satisfied with what you're doing, and most of us are honest enough to know when we are doing a bad job. So instead of trying to please everybody and everybody around you, if the focus is on, am I doing work that satisfies me? Chances are success will follow. And I'm doing this because that is one less thing to worry about. And the fewer the things that are to worry about, the easier it is to do them. So hopefully I don't have to worry about success. As long as I feel satisfied in what I'm doing, success will follow. It's also a good re recipe for a long-term solution because people keep changing what they think is interesting. Today, they like jeans. Tomorrow, they might like bell bottoms. Day after tomorrow, they like shorts. So if I'm driven by, quote unquote, an external definition of am I being successful, I will keep spending all my money in changing my wardrobe. Whereas if I have my own sense of the fact that, yes, uh, a lungi is a good enough way to feel satisfied. The external world will keep changing and I'm still at peace with it. And you'll be surprised how often the external world begins to respect what you feel at peace with. Uh, as I'm sure you have several people who are very comfortable in who they are and the rest of the world begins to respect them as opposed to chasing the rest of the world, which is an endless job. So hence this suggestion to simplify it, that let's talk about how can I increase the odds of my satisfaction with the assumption and not with the assumption, with the belief that success will then follow. So another Calvin cartoon, becoming an adult is probably the dumbest thing you can ever do. And I love Calvin. I don't know how many of you uh, uh, know Calvin and Hobbes or have read the cartoons. It's pretty dated. Uh, Bill Watterson, who was the creator of Calvin, I think stopped writing any new uh, Calvin cartoons, maybe more than a decade and a half ago. I don't remember. And he's a very interesting guy who, by the way, never sold the rights of Calvin to any commercial company. So you cannot legally buy Calvin mugs and t-shirts and all of this stuff because he decided that he was doing the work to get the satisfaction that he did and not to make bucket loads of money. And so no Calvin licensing has been done to uh, commercial companies. And he stopped writing it when he was at the top of his game. So, and then he became a watercolor painter. And by the way, he's a pretty damn good painter also. Um, so anyways, uh, this was one of the things that Calvin was expressing, but most of the people who are students at PEC really have no option but to become an adult. So uh, let's... As he waits for his bus. So I'll propose a model for thinking about the ways we interact with the world. Why do we do anything? How do we do it? Who do, it, do we do it with? And what do we do? And we'll go inside out. So for example, let's say you're playing tennis or you're playing cricket or you're playing soccer. So why do you play any of these games? Is it because your brother plays them? Is it because your parents believe this is the right game to do? Is it because you are good at the game? Is it because there's a lot of money in the game? That's the why part of it. How do you play this game? And this is really, really tactical. Do you play seriously? Do you play with all your energy? Do you play as a sore loser? Do you play to get energy out of the game? Do you play fairly? Do you cheat? Uh, that is what I mean by how the really the nuts and bolts of, of how do you do things. 
who do you play with do you play with your classmates do you go play with the mohalla guys or gals uh, do you play with people in the league and what do you play do you play cricket or do you play football or what are you playing now the first two the why and the how are under our own control they are more self defined you can choose why you do something and you can choose how you do it the last two the who and the what are less under our control the people who come to play can change you really don't have as much control over it you can try and choose your team but you can't choose your opponents also what you play can change if it starts raining your game will change especially in the context of work what you work on is seldom under your control circumstances end up changing it so it's the why and the how that we'll focus on because they are more under your control and therefore you can do something about it for decades in your life whereas the who and the what can change with circumstances if you are in a job your boss can change what project you work on you are done the who will change the what will change but why you are working and how you are working is still under your control so i will focus on the why and the how to try and share a couple of the lessons that i have learned uh, that in my view increase the odds of satisfaction and therefore the odds of success any questions or shall we keep marching on yeah we can okay. proceed okay so let's let's look at this using a couple of uh, i'll walk through four different problems that several of us need to solve and see if there are any lessons on the why and the how now problem number 1 i need a job we all need a job i need to pay our bills it gives us a sense of identity who we are and so on and so forth ironically in india and i'm not sure how many of you have uh, i'm sure hardik can comment to this also given that he's built large teams and so on and so forth so hardik please do tell me if i'm misrepresenting what it is most companies complain that they cannot find good people and yet we have millions of people who are unemployed every year about 15 million people graduate from college and of that 12 million can't find a job and still the companies are complaining that they can't find good people so what is going on here how do i as a person who's looking for a job put myself in a situation to find a better job so some suggestions when you are talking to an employer focus on their problem don't ask what can they do for you ask what can i do for them why because that communicates a a message of the fact that you want to solve their problems as opposed to you want something out of it okay and we'll see as these themes develop second genuinely care about the job not play acting don't go interview for a job that you don't care about or train yourself to care about every job because every job by the way is very interesting starting from doing bpo work to being a software programmer and so on and so forth because it's a long journey and things lead to very interesting places so genuinely care about the job do your homework ask questions learn about the company the interviewer this comes through to the person who's talking to you if you genuinely care other people figure it out if you are acting people figure it out so genuinely care about the job and make learning and action a part of your life right now not waiting for the job but right now how you learn and what you act on builds up over time let us say i am in the second year of my college and i start making learning and action a part of my agenda right away those things will accumulate over the next 2 years so by the time i show up for a job interview i have a history of these things people believe in demonstrated action a lot more than in fancy words so if somebody were to ask you hey do you take initiative do you like to learn new things telling them yes is one part of it but actually pointing out to them that look over the last 2 years i decided to learn the mouth organ or the guitar on my own and not only did i decide to learn i actually then got a few people together we started a small band we sound horrible nobody invites us but yet we meet every second saturday that is a lot more convincing 
than words which everybody will throw out. This action and learning is another theme that you will show. So this is one kind of problem. Some suggestions for what I've found works for jobs, and then we'll abstract it out into the lessons as we go forward. Yeah, uh, Ashish, quick question here. How, how would this fit into the campus placement model which we are seeing where companies come with a definite requirement and the pools of candidates sit in? The candidates do not really get time for that one-to-one -one connection where the right perspective is put across. What are your thoughts on that? Excellent point. So two separate sets of things. One is some of these things might not fit into the campus placement model. Okay, so let's first deal with that which does not fit, and then we'll come to the campus basement model. However, most of us are developing habits. And I will not be doing campus placement after my first job. Starting to form those habits early will then put me in a good place subsequently also. So of those lessons that you believe are worth practicing, getting those habits in place earlier rather than later is one reason because there is never a good time to get started on developing habits other than right now. Second, from a campus placement perspective, some of these things will show up in your resume. The desire and initiative to learn and do things, for example, will show up outside of your resume. Uh, sorry, in your resume, I beg your pardon it will quote unquote differentiate the person from the other resumes that show up. And resumes can be written to highlight the fact that, hey, I like to learn, I like to do new things. Some of the other things, for example, the one-on-one -on -one interaction in which to be able to communicate the desire to solve problems and the fact that one cares might not get highlighted there. So you're absolutely right. That could be a missed opportunity. Some people will end up doing internships once in a while. There, there is an opportunity to actually practice some of these things and demonstrate them while one is an intern, where one tries to do the best one can in terms of solving whatever problem one can, even if they are small problems, even if they are outside my agenda. For example, somebody leaves the coffee machine dirty or the kitchen sink dirty. This is not about showing anybody something. But if I care and if I'm interested in solving the problem, I will clear it up if I get a chance and I have the time. And not expecting that somebody is going to give me a medal for it, but because it develops the habit. Uh, your point is absolutely valid. Some of these things will be demonstrable in a, in a campus scenario, but some will not. But they will all have an opportunity to flourish over the coming years. Yeah, that's a, no, actually, that's a great point. And I will also like to uh, tell everyone here that PEC rather has a model where students are given an opportunity to have a six month internship before they face the D-Day, which kind of allows them to explore what they find. And in your words, what really satisfies them doing, but, but totally your point taken. One word of caution that I would, I would give you, which is somehow there is a lot of emphasis on find your passion. I would submit to you that most of us don't know our passion. So don't worry if you don't know your passion. I don't know my passion after now I'm 54 years old and I still don't know my passion. And putting pressure on somebody who's 19 years old, 20 years old, who's never worked in any company to say, what is your passion? is a totally unfair question. You will find that a lot of the things that you do, you begin to like. And very few rare people, maybe 1% of the world, and this is not a statistic that you should count on. I'm just cooking it up. So please treat it as a very small number of people know their passion. Somebody becomes a musician because they know their passion. The vast majority of humanity has no idea what their passion is. So get satisfaction out of doing a good job of whatever you are doing, rather than constantly being dissatisfied saying, this is not my passion. And after several years of doing something, you will find that it becomes their passion or most of us will never discover our passion, but yet we still have to find satisfaction and joy in whatever we do. So don't beat yourself up if you haven't found your passion. You are in companies of 
99.9% of the world or 99% of the world or some number, uh, but the vast majority of people. So that would be my only other submission to you uh, because I find that this passion business keeps showing up time and time again. And I find it a very unreasonable request to make of anybody. And if you know your passion, by the way, you don't have to find it. Uh, it grabs you by the throat and doesn't let you go. Yeah, uh, Mr. Ashish, there is a very interesting question which has come up just in the continuation of that. Ji. In the pursuit of satisfaction, how does one avoid the pitfall of doing something which is ethically incorrect? We have seen a lot of corporate people reaching the peak of their careers and then kind of making a mistake which is like completely disastrous for their careers. Right. How, how does one avoid that? And what is the basically root cause of that? given your success and traction framework? So uh, I have, I'm not able to go back. So I don't know what I'm doing. I can only go forward. Ah, I can go back. So if we come back to the how, these are the kinds of things that one chooses in the how. Will I work honestly? Will I work ethically? Will I work in a fair manner? So that is the base assumptions of things that you have to make a call on. If you find that indeed doing unethical things does not interfere with your satisfaction, okay, then you should go ahead and do that. But then you should be clear that you're making a conscious choice to do that. One of the points that I will make in this is being honest to yourself is very, very important. And that is why why comes right at the heart of the matter. Why am I doing something? So let's look at dishonesty. If I'm doing something to solve a problem and being unethical, so the most, the most famous story of this that I can think of is the Mahabharat, where uh, Draupadi Chirharan gets brought up very often as what are the ethics of that entire shameful event? Who was right? Who was wrong? What is dharma? Okay. And I'm not learned or educated enough, but I would request you or suggest you, uh, for example, one of the books by Gurcharan Das called uh, The Difficulty of Being Good it has an amazing analysis of exactly this. If the why you are doing something is well answered. Once in a while, you will find that the ethical dilemma actually has an answer which says, I will do something unethical. For example, I want to get a driver's license. And by the way, this is a real incident. I tried to get a driver's license in Bangalore without paying an agent. After four, five, six visits to the RTO's office, where they would basically give me the runaround. I was finally told that, look, you will never get a driver's license unless you pay an agent. And the agent will keep some money. The agent will give some money to the RTO's office. Everybody is happy. You will get your license. You keep coming here and you refuse to pay an agent. We will keep making you come here till you are tired and you give up on getting a license. So I paid an agent. Very interesting example of the question that whoever asked, is this unethical? Answer is yes. At what point in time do I make a call that I will do something like that? Is something that a judgment that I have to make and go forward. So I'm not giving a very clear answer, but this is something that the person has to draw a line as to what are they willing to do? And more importantly, why are they willing to do that? Okay. Uh, sorry, that is not a very clear cut answer. Uh, I would suspect that most people will find that cheating somebody else would not be a very good way to be satisfied. And the satisfaction will come from solving problems as opposed to from, and in literally two slides, I'll discuss one of the main reasons why a lot of people end up cheating and, uh, and why that is not a source of satisfaction. Yeah, no, great point, uh, Ashish. I think we can uh, move on. You okay. very 
finally answered a question which was which kind of touched upon a lot of gray matter of life and really like the example of the difficulty of being good i think it really captures the sense okay so i need fame and fortune okay one of the main reasons why people cheat uh is to quickly either get money or get credit the two main reasons as the joke goes in your wallet you either have cash or credit so this is the wallet of life you either you have cash and you have fame or credit so clearly they are useful they are they get people places uh, life is good and so on and so forth and they also cause stress having them causes stress not having them causes stress not having them causes more stress uh and therefore most people want to desire stuff and social media amplifies both the value and the stress of wealth and fame it is idolized people take pictures of their vacations in switzerland to make everybody else feel like what a wonderful place i've been to whereas you ashish were sitting in panipat in your nani's home uh and then i feel are yaar i should also have gone to switzerland um so social media is probably one of the biggest drivers of this um uh, and you find all kinds of ways that that gets driven and the irony is that there is no sure shot solution to either of them cheating often shows up as one of the solutions to them but it usually turns out to be a short lived solution where one ends up in a sticky place 9 times out of 10 from whatever i've seen so what is it that i have learned i have learned that fame and fortune are outcomes you cannot consciously try and get fame or fortune they are outcomes what you can consciously do is to try and solve a problem so let's look at some of the examples several of you have i'm sure heard about so we talk about flipkart flipkart is and we talk about amazon so when jetly was bought by amazon uh, 98 i had the opportunity to work with Uh, with bezos on a few projects and a few other people there who grown on to become extremely extremely successful and powerful their focus was not how are they going to get rich bezos used to drive a honda civic in 1998 when the company was already worth more than 10 billion dollars and he used to stay in a two bedroom apartment and he was not interested in becoming rich he was already plenty rich that is not what was going to make him satis- satisfied what he was motivated by from what i could gather and what we would see is solving the next problem you look at elon musk he has more than enough money and he has more than enough fame but what drives is solving the next problem look at bill gates he is giving away his money at this point in time but the desire is to solve a problem and these are famous names all the smaller companies yet to be famous maybe never to be famous startups you will find that it is the problem that keeps people going most of them actually know that they will never be successful and they will never be famous and they will never be rich 99% of the startups fail hardik you know that you've seen several dead bodies around you both in your tenure as zomato the number of failed food companies in india and requires a long register uh to put down the names and that is what happens to most startups yet people keep starting companies so money and fame are outcomes the input is problem solving notice problem solving showed up in our job uh motivation also second as we learn and we become better we increase the chance of becoming successful becoming successful is not guaranteed it's not a privilege that any one of us has by becoming better at what we do we increase the odds so learning is the driver to increase the probability as the joke goes that fortune knocks on everybody's door the question is who opens the door who is willing to get up from the couch and go to the door and open the door and take the risk that it is not fortune but it is a beggar but when you open the door enough number of times you will find that one of those times fortune will also show up so it is about increasing the chances and that comes from learning and improvement one other practical advice is 
take help from other people to handle the frustration that comes out of not having money and fortune. It's a real frustration. And for some of us, it stays throughout our life. Talk to parents, talk to older people, because several of them have dealt with this frustration for many, many years already and have valuable lessons to share. But to increase your own odds, focus on problem solving and keep trying to get better at what you do is at least what I believe are the ways to get to fame and fortune. Maybe there is no guarantee. Another challenge, I need good relationships. Of course, we all do. Some of them are because we are looking for a spouse or a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Most dates are gathered through other relationships. Well, at least they were. I don't know in the age of Match and Tinder and uh, all of the uh, apps, dating apps, whether that is still the true. Most jobs are through references. You will find that after the first job, which is campus placement, pretty much every job comes because somebody in the hiring company said, call up Hardik. I think he's a great guy to work with. And that is what keeps you going from one place to another place. And believe me, that is the single biggest reason why people get hired. So relationships are very, very important for practical reasons. And then also for happiness. There is a Harvard study that has been going on for 75 years. They've been tracking people from the time they were students all the way to the die. And relationships is the single factor that is common to all people who stay happy. So of course, we all need good relationships. So how do we develop good relationships? Care about people and be honest. So we come back to the ethical question here again, Hardik. What do we mean by caring about people? It doesn't mean that you just say yes. You don't try and please people. When you care for somebody, you tell them what you honestly think is good for them. And don't expect anything in return. We don't expect that our friends will do something for us. We are friends because we feel like we want to be friends. And just the act of being a friend is good enough. So that builds relationships. The word networking shows up very often when I talk to people. Networking is the single bullshittest word that I have come across in a long time. It misguides people into somehow believing that just go and meet as many people as you can, collect cards, shake hands, get LinkedIn relationships, usually accounts for nothing. What people care for is the experience that they have had knowing the person deeply. It is better to have a few deep relationships. And this is much, much harder in the era of Facebook friends and LinkedIn connects and so on and so forth. So even though this advice might come across as being highly counterintuitive and definitely not conventional, network in a way where you build deep relationships, not as a way of having a million flowers bloom because they will basically be a million unbloomed buds rather than even one flower. So from this, the things that I would point out is care about people and the other one will actually follow. You can't care about hundreds of people and you can't listen to hundreds of people. So you will find that the deeper relationships will develop per force. Yeah, uh, I yes, think, great point here. Just, just a quick question. How, what are some of the tips and tricks to create those relationships and steer away from pure just for the heck of getting to know someone because that person can help you in future. How, what a starting point. So two, two pieces of advice, which are unfortunately the same thing that shows up in everything that I'm talking about. If you care about the person genuinely, even if you and I are chatting for 10 minutes, in those 10 minutes, focus on, I should focus on you. And I should try and figure out, can I be of any use to you? And nine times out of 10, it is just to listen to you. Because what use can I be of you? Can I be to you? But you will find just this listening to people is tremendously useful to most people because most of us are not listening. Most of us are trying to figure out what can I tell this other guy as opposed to can I really listen to them? So in my mind, there is a very simple way 
that I have found very useful to develop relationships is to see if you can solve a problem for somebody. And that is not from the point of superiority, but just from the perspective of listening to the person. And you will find that amazing things happen after that. Yeah. Okay. And not expecting something in return, which is, I'm trying to figure out what use I can be of, as opposed to trying to figure out what use can you be for me, is the single biggest issue I find in networking. Networking is usually driven by saying, let me try and figure out what can I get out of Hardik. So therefore, I will only make friends with the guy who can be of some use to me. And at least I find that it is a fairly broken way of developing relationships. Because most people are smart enough to know that this other guy is trying to be a leech. We assume others are idiots. Usually we are the idiots. And most of the other people are smarter than us. So it's, it's good to recognize that up front and behave accordingly. Um, the last challenge, I need to stay informed. There is so much stuff going on. I need to be a smart person. That is the reason why you are studying at PEC. That's the reason why you are studying at all is to be informed. The internet has become a nuisance. There is so much information out there that you can be informed 24 by seven, not sleep, and you will still not know a fraction of what needs to be known. So clearly that is not the way to solve the problem. It is especially hard to focus because one keeps going from one thing to another thing to another thing and another thing, and one understands nothing. And clearly I don't like social networking, by that you would have figured out by now. Social networking makes it even harder because my WhatsApp stuff is giving me one article about why zebras have stripes. The next article is about the discovery of cold fusion. The next article is about uh, Ashwarya Rai having run away with somebody else and so on and so forth. And before I know it, I basically have squandered hours and I really know nothing about anything else. So at least in my mind, much more important than knowing is understanding. And this, by the way, again, comes back to developing a habit. And this comes back to learning. Learning is not knowing things. Learning is understanding things. So somebody who knows the diameter of the earth, the distance from the earth to the sun, the number of people in Bihar, uh, what were the statistics? Yes, that is a useful thing in some circumstance. But that is usually not what learning entails. Learning entails the ability to understand stuff deeply. So don't worry about what you don't know. Listen to the person who's telling you stuff that you don't know. It's wonderful. They feel good. You develop a relationship. You might even learn something if you keep asking them why. So keep asking why. And you will find that that allows one to go deep as opposed to go wide. So instead of if somebody says, hey, have you heard about that uh, tsunami in Philippines? Instead of saying, well, I heard of that tsunami in Australia also. Let us instead ask, what more can you tell me about that tsunami in Philippines? Because now the other person is being heard, that relationship will become deeper, and maybe one will walk away having learned something more about that tsunami, as opposed to trying to tell other people that I know about the tsunami in Australia. So for every one tsunami you throw at me, I will throw two tsunamis back at you, which is usually how conversations progress much more interesting is why or tell me more and that plays back into your relationship point hardik very simple tool and instead of going shallow and wide one goes narrow and deep at the end of it maybe we will walk away with some learnings about philippines and practice focus which i will leave up to you but i do believe that's a very important skill especially if one wants to stay learn if one wants to keep learning as opposed to just know a bunch of useless facts or random facts might not be useless. So if I were to bring this together, these four different examples, what are at least in my mind, some of the lessons? So the why in my view is twofold. It is basically to be better and to make things better. The problem solving is actually just an example of making things better. So I think the why has to be, I want to become better and I want to solve problems. 
which means I want to make the state of the world better. And this is not from a pompous place. It is not, I am so good that I will solve all the problems. No, but rather whatever little problem I can solve, I would love to try and solve that. That is the why. And the how is to care about things genuinely and to care about others and do it with a level of commitment, not with a level of drama, but with a level of commitment. So actually believe and care. And in my mind, if one can practice these two things or these two tools, you will find that the who begins to move in your favor. The people who interact with you will begin to help you out. Why? Because the relationships get deeper. They figure out that you care about them and therefore most human beings care about you. You will find that the what gets solved because the people around you open up more opportunities for you. If I give you an example of Jungli, for instance, we started as four friends. So, and those so, same friends have opened up many, many other opportunities for me. I invested in Make My Trip because of a different friend, a gentleman called Ravi. I invested in Flipkart because of yet another friend, a gentleman called Shubhrato. So this is not because of any other reason, but if people want, believe that that relationship is good, they open more doors and life becomes easier and easier. So try and solve problems, try and become better. And by the way, I'm not suggesting that I'm good at any of these. Just because I'm sharing these lessons with you doesn't mean that I'm a good practitioner. Actually, a drunk is the best person to tell you that you should not drink alcohol because they speak from the experience of mistakes. So please don't confuse this with uh, talking to somebody who knows how to practice this. A lot of these lessons are by virtue of not being able to practice them well and then realizing, I wish I could. So you will find that the who and the what get solved as very interesting side effects of focusing on what you can control, that to marginally, which is to become better and to do things in a better manner by improving quote unquote process, which is caring and committing. So that's, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, pretty much all that I had to, to say. The great news in all of this is that we get multiple chances. So if somebody feels distressed that, oh, they did not get a good job in the first campus placement, please don't worry. Life gives you lots and lots of chances. And there is, if one stays the course and keeps in mind that there is a 30 year journey and you make the best of the relationships, approach that job with the right why and the right how, you will find that somebody that you are interacting with there will open a door for you. And the examples are endless. I can give you several examples from my own life, several that I gave you already. And as you talk to people, you will find that we all get multiple chances. So keep a positive outlook for the long run. Relationships make a huge difference and focus on the problem. Don't focus on the rewards, which by the way, the Gita has said it more eloquently than I ever can, the Karmanivadi Karasthi portion. You'll be amazed how important and valuable that lesson is uh, and how accurate it is. So in summary, this was Calvin's view that the world owes me happiness, fulfillment, and success. The answer is the world owes you nothing. And you have to figure out how to do as much as you can from the why perspective for the folks around you, solve problems, improve yourself. And you will find that happiness, fulfillment, and success uh, come out as side effects uh, of a whole bunch of this stuff. Uh, for example, Flipkart, when it started, everybody who invested in that company in the beginning felt that if the company becomes worth $100 million, that would be fantastic. The company was bought for $20 billion by Walmart. So clearly nobody who was involved in the earliest part of the company was shooting for that number. As time went on, more and more things became clear and the size of the price kept increasing. 
But at all points in time, the focus was not that price because you didn't even know where that price was or what it was. The focus was, can you solve the customer delivery problem better? Can you solve the product choice problem better? And so on and so forth. Amazon has a saying that even today they keep saying, it is still day one, which means that we have just started on the journey, which means there are many, many more problems to solve as opposed to we have arrived. So problems and solving those problems is a great way to find that you run into satisfaction and hopefully success. Yeah, all right. Uh... I think my key takeaway, Ashish, from your beautiful lecture is that we probably need to do more introspection than we are doing currently because some of the questions really touch the core of oneself, I would say. So I have a lot of questions here and, and please let me know at sure. short time, you would not want to take more questions. Yeah, okay. um, go for it. I'll start picking in random order and, and I'll pick this question from Alokik. By the way, I, I kind of know Alokik from personal capacity and he happens to also okay. be an alumni of Peck and then Stanford, just like yourself. He did his okay. master's from there. His question is, uh, Ashish, what habits you have seen effective in daily life to be present, to learn, to basically understand the why? To understand the why? Uh, so I don't know what works to understand the why. Uh, other than to keep an open mind. So intellectual honesty, I think is a very, very great tool. So I would have that suggestion, which is when we assume that we already know something, then we find that it is very hard to actually figure out the why. So let's take an example. So one of the things that I do for a living is to invest in companies and you learn some lessons. You learn that a company should hire a salesperson at a certain point, or that they should hire a salesperson of a certain type. And then when you encounter the next company, you try and say, ah, this is what we need to do. But we never stop and ask the why again. The why is frequently because it was done the last time. So to Alokik's point, I think if one is intellectually honest, which is to check the facts of the new situation one more time, one will have a better chance of being able to accept the why. So I would say intellectual honesty, which also implies open-mindedness. And therefore you have to take your past learnings less seriously. The time could have changed, the people could have changed. And there is a friend of mine, by the way, uh, he runs another company in Bangalore. Uh, Every time I would meet him, he would say, I'm meeting a new person because since the last time I met you, all your cells have died and been replaced or most of them have died and replaced. So it is a new person. So even if you said something to me the last time, uh, I'm going to ask you several of the things one more time because you have changed since the last time you have met. Now that of course is um, ultimate intellectual honesty and that was a way of pulling my leg. But I think that is one good way of being able to learn the why, uh, which is to not put too much credit in one's past learnings and be open to rejecting those as new data arrives. Yeah. All right. Uh, and Ashish, I'll also like to switch gears here a little bit because there are a lot of questions popping up, which might not be directly related to the session we had, but more from- No challenge at all. Ji, sure. So this is a great question asked by Manpreet Singh Juneja. He's asking that most of the people, if you see today, having an illustrious careers till the age of 40, typically in, in tech companies, then they venture on to do investments for wealth creation. What could be the starting point given from your experience who have made successful investments in a lot of companies? Uh, what would, I'm assuming that uh, uh, Manpreet is asking what is the starting point for an investing career? Okay, yes. so given that we can't, uh, interact real time, I'll assume that is the question. If he uh, clarifies it differently, let me know. So see, there are a few different reasons people stumble into startup investing. One of which is because they became successful and therefore they said they feel that 
they want to continue the startup journey but not in the same intense manner but rather vicariously through other people's experience so it is very hard so there are some people who by the way continue to start company after company after company uh, they are serial entrepreneurs so for instance uh, mukesh bansal who runs cure fit had started mintra before that and mintra got sold to to flipkart uh, and he now has started cure fit so he could very well have become an investor but he chose instead to start another company uh, i started uh, three companies before i became an investor so one reason people become an investor is because they are either there is not a great idea that they believe in or they are tired or they feel that a better way to be on their journey is to be in the back seat of somebody else driving the car so that is one reason why people uh, get started now the how in the case of these people is often by becoming an angel investor because of a past success they have money which they can afford to lose by the way most angel investments go to zero so please don't become an angel investor with a view that it will make you rich most likely the money that an angel investor puts in goes to zero that is the experience of most angel investors so several of the people who have made money as successful entrepreneurs become angel investors because they can afford to lose that money it is not their life savings and this is one way to learn and then they slowly figure out oh i shouldn't do this i should do this blah 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 and they become investors the other way is if one is far enough along in the career is to go seek employment with an investment company and i personally took the path of becoming a kaufman fellow which is an educational program but that is a very restricted program and there are very few such programs uh, across the world so the only other reliable mechanism is to go find a job with some investor often for the first year it might even be unpaid because they want to see how committed you are but that would be my recommendation for somebody uh, who either cannot afford to or doesn't want to start using angel investing as a path yeah thanks thanks for the answer ashish uh, again the questions keep on uh, pump uh, so this, i have another question here again a little off track but because people are so keen to learn from your own personal experiences so this question is asked by mohit shri vastava he is asking that just from your own personal experience when you look upon when you reflect upon some of the mistakes which you made yeah. and what were the key lessons which you learned from there in your whole journey okay uh, uh is the screen visible yes okay so some of the mistakes the, the top part is uh, trying to imitate other people in life which is one of the reasons i was making the distinction between satisfaction and success so i took my first job because one of my friends went to work for ibm research i took my second job because one of my other friends was having more fun in oracle now the first guy was also having fun so i should have asked why the hell did was i not having fun if the first guy was having fun why did i need to find a second guy who was fun, having fun because the answer is because i was trying to use other people's answer for myself uh it's like we all enjoy different foods just because you like tandoori chicken doesn't mean that i should try and eat that so that was one mistake and this by the way it still goes on i still make this mistake so it's not like all these are in the rear view mirror the intensity has reduced the second one was walking away from opportunities for lack of patience and uh that is for example i left uh, ibm i had a fantastic boss i left oracle i had an absolutely outstanding boss i left amazon it was the opportunity of a lifetime and walked away from all of these places because i was impatient and some of these i will regret forever because they were life changing opportunities so that was the other mistake that i have made repeatedly not even once and lessons from this which is not the second part so i will address your second question which is what were the lessons from some of these mistakes 
part of it ties to Alokik's question also. One lesson is to look back and ask, why did I make this mistake? And be honest about the answer. That doesn't mean that the next time I will not make this mistake, but the chances reduce. So we are back to the learning theme. If I learn from my prior mistakes, it's not that the mistakes will not repeat, but the probability of those mistakes will go down. So the lesson from all of these are try and figure out what works for me, what will give me satisfaction. When I look at it from the success lens, I'm beginning to ask, what does the world value uh, as opposed to what do I value? So that is the lesson from the first one, which comes back to the title of the talk and the lack of patience. I don't know if I, if I will ever be patient, Hardik. So that mm -hmm. maybe just old age will beat me into submission. Uh, that is still an ongoing problem. So I recognize it. And once in a while, I can maybe avoid making a very serious mistake. Uh, but it is what it is as of now. Thanks, thanks for that, Ashish. Uh, another interesting question is coming from Shivam Jand. He's asking that, and this is a quite a relevant question. I think it is going to touch upon everyone's life from all spheres of life. He's asking, how do you pick yourself up from the lack of drive you feel sometimes in life? Yeah, great question. And a bloody hard question. <laughs> and I wish I knew the answer. Okay. Um, so, as some of you have better answers to this, uh, please share with me also. Uh, so some of it, Shivam, comes about by, at least from what I've seen, by having good relationships. I think people around you do a better job of picking you up, in my case, than me myself. So if I go and talk to three friends and tell them that boss, I feel that part of my French, I'm screwed and just life is going to hell in a handbasket and stuff like that. You will find that it is those relationships around you that band together and uh, tell you, no, no, life is good. Look, uh, it's not all bad. This will happen and so on and so forth. So I think at least in my case, those relationships and being honest with them is the single biggest driver. And part of it is also because if I'm down, then at one level from a mechanical system or then the system has a problem in it and therefore relying on something outside the system is a more logical uh, tool as opposed to expecting a self-correcting mechanism. The other part of it is what self, how can you decrease the probability of feeling down? so that the pickup question doesn't show up. That is where tools like meditation and trying to solve problems for others is really helpful. When you try and solve problems for others, then your own problems become less intimidating. And there is a lot of scientific evidence to this. There are neurological studies. And of course, there is a lot of spiritual text and that evidence, but there is also a lot of scientific evidence that talks about when you focus on solving other people's problems, your own problems actually become less. So, for example, if you're feeling down and you go volunteer in a homeless shelter or cooking food for the hungry and stuff, you will find that you come back feeling charged up. And I have tried it out multiple times as have several other folks. So it works. So my submission to you would be therefore twofold. First is rely on relationships and two is try and solve other people's problems. Uh, and maybe three, I can't count any longer is try and do things that prevent this incidence of going down to begin with, which are things like meditation and also the first two, which is relationships and focusing on other people's problems or helping people. Yeah, I think that's a lot of content for a question as uh, broad as that one and difficult as that one. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks again for that. I think the questions are keep on getting harder and harder because I have another one. Okay. <laughs> so this question is by Ashish. Uh, 
he ha- by the way his name is ashish gupta as well he happens to be my yeah. colleague at uh, food panda peck alumni ji uh, uh, he's asking how can be one cognizant of and deal with individual biases when we are building relationships how can we one how can one be cognizant of individual biases and i'm assuming he's referring to our own biases yes yes uh, i think so yeah uh so you know it comes back to listening um and learning so as my suggestion was this business of uh, caring and committing uh, caring is as one is in a relationship if i care about that relationship i will listen and the biases will become very clear the other person will tell you your biases if they believe that you actually care about the relationship and uh, hartik are you married or do you have a significant other i'm i'm right in between i just got engaged okay uh, congratulations uh, have you had an instance where your fiance would tell you uh, about your bias if you were in the mood to listen and will actually not tell you about a bias if you're not in the mood to listen so that that hasn't happened that much but i i can see where you're coming from so well you're a lucky man in that either you don't have enough biases or you care so much that you're managing to overcome them the vast majority of us don't do as good a job uh i think when the other person gets the message very clearly that you care you will find even strangers will tell you about the fact that you are approaching it from a biased perspective and you yourself will become cognizant if one is actually listening because it is very hard to listen and listening and understanding something is the best way to figure out that oh then it forces you to ask hmm but i believed something different 5 minutes ago and now hartik is telling me that it is not blue it is green if i'm actually listening to hardik i will then ask myself then why am i thinking this is blue because both can't be true whereas if i'm in the mood to tell him that no 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 this is green then i will never get out of my bias then i will spend all my tel- time telling him it is green and if he's willing to listen maybe he will be at that point in time or if he cares for that subject and the relationship then maybe he will sort his bias out but i won't because i will try and sell him blue yeah it also reminds me how i i was constantly reminded by my previous manager he had this one beautiful sentence he would always repeat uh, mm-hmm. you listen to understand do not listen to respond and i think you have touched upon the topic right quite quite well here yeah. so i and and please uh, ashish let me know when it's time right because i am good i am good for a while because uh, i have nothing more to do tonight all right so so i think still for everyone's reference let's just keep uh, 12 20 ist as the end of the session so we have 10 more minutes to go so another question which is coming is again there are a lot of questions i'm picking randomly um so ashish being an investor right you have pump money and made really successful exits how do you really see through the motivation of an entrepreneur who's sitting across the table and pitching you an idea because you talked about problem solving but because i'm curious are people solving problems because it's intellectually stimulating or it's they get a social validation out of it because hey i'm this cool thing i'm working on how how do you do that yeah so people start companies Uh, some people start companies for making money some people start companies because they actually believe the problem now you are asking how do i figure out whether they are solving and then you are asking an even more deeper question which is why are they solving the problem to begin with is it because they believe that uh, there will be social validation or because they really care about the problem most people that i have met 
starting a company is so bloody hard where everybody tells them that they are an idiot. Uh, it's a sign of madness. And I mean this positively. Madness is anything which is not normal. And starting out to climb Mount Everest is not normal because that is not what most people do. And starting a company is not normal. Most people don't do it for social validation because it is too hard. In fact, society is telling them that this is a bad idea to do. Despite that, they go ahead and start the companies. So social validation is the most infrequent reason that, uh, that I have seen. There are some people who become entrepreneurs because they think it is, it is cool. So they didn't pick that problem because of social validation, but they decided to become an entrepreneur because they thought that their friends will think it is cool. So uh, how do we then figure that out? Those kinds of people, if you find, if you watch for a little while, then you will find that just the difficulty of being in the startup makes it hard for them to sustain. And this comes out through conversations. So the tools to figure this out are mostly conversations, disagreements, which is to argue their contrary position just for the sake of it. When they say, I think this is a good problem, I will often argue that, no, it is not a good problem or that these are all the problems with the problem and why this business is not going to succeed and see how they react. Also reference checking. So we come back to relationships one more time. Uh, asking their friends, their ex-bosses and stuff as to why is this person doing things is usually a very, very good giveaway. And because there are two, three people working together, when you talk to people individually and ask them, why is the other person doing tough? Uh, it is very much like uh, when three people have committed a crime and the police interrogates them three separately, you get three versions of the truth. Uh, that same approach, but for positive reasons, also helps shed light on people's motivations. So creating conscious conflict by disagreeing to figure out what is their motivation, reference checking with, uh, with prior relationships, and having conversations with the multiple people involved to get a sense of their motivations is what I end up finding useful. Yeah. No, this is, this is quite great. Ashish, very well articulated. I wish my articulation was even half as good as yours would have scored much better marks in my board exams back in time. But I'm, I'm going to club a lot of questions now because those are on similar themes from Nipun, Ji. Devansh. They're asking, what is, what is your take on role of privilege in one's success later on? And similar theme is also how can people from economically weaker backgrounds with more liabilities also treat, also go on the path of entrepreneurship? Yeah. So see, privilege is a, is a huge advantage. There is just absolutely no denying that. Uh, and it makes things much easier for folks who either started out with privilege or who became privileged because of some incidental success. So I think a lot of these are, uh, we have to figure out what works for each one of us. So I'll take a slightly different dimension. So let's say somebody has a, a family member who has health issues and that does not enable them to become an entrepreneur because time is needed to attend to this family member's health problems. And by the way, this is also the reason I picked satisfaction and not success because from the world's perspective, this person can never meet the milestone of success because they never went ahead and took the risk to become an entrepreneur or go become a musician. But however, the satisfaction part of it, which is that they did what they thought needed to be done, is what they can choose to optimize. Am I making sense? 
And by the way, this applies even for the person who chose to become an entrepreneur, because if they optimize for success and the company was not going anywhere for two years, should they quit then? Uh, or should they quit in three years? What if it becomes successful in four years? So the question for what should somebody who's from an economically disadvantaged background do to become an entrepreneur, I honestly do not have a good answer uh, because I have not encountered the problem myself. And I say this with due humility. I'm very lucky to be able to say this. Therefore, I do not have a good appreciation of what the challenges are. Uh, by virtue of being an armed forces brat, I had a privileged existence. What I could suggest, however, is that there will be many chances to be an entrepreneur. So even if one goes down the path of saying, I will curtail my entrepreneurial impulses for the first three, four years, first get a job to get in a position where I have de-risked some of my other commitments which are getting in the way, that is a perfectly fine approach. I know people who have become entrepreneurs at the age of 40. Actually, I know a person who's just started his company at the age of 60. Uh, and this is not an oddball exception. Uh, but I wish I had a more constructive answer. Uh, I just lack the knowledge and the context. Yeah. All right. Uh, Ashish, I'm going to ask one lengthier question. And then before Jeez. we end the session, I'm just going to ask three very quick questions. Jeez. So the so the question is, it's again pertaining to your own personal life. Uh, Ujwal is asking, how was the transition from an academic background when you went on to do your PhD from Stanford to a corporate environment? What were some of the nuances, if you can throw some light? Mm -hmm. and essentially, after that, what prompted you to start your own company? So the transition from academics to corporate, and you will all go through this because you're all going to, well, uh, most of your, it seems like people are already through that transition. So this might actually be useless advice. Uh, so it is a transition from socialism to capitalism. Uh, education is all about socialist. As the joke goes, if you don't have a heart when you're in college, or if you're not a communist when you're in college, then you don't have a heart. And uh, if you don't become a capitalist when you get a job, then you don't have a brain. So it is that transition that one will go through in most cases. So in college, one is molly coddled, one is talking about what is fair. You spend your time talking about why the equal opportunity makes sense. And the moment one gets a corporate job, you start justifying why I should get a promotion and 50% uh, raise while everybody else deserve a 20% raise. Okay, so that is one transition that, uh, and I hope that more people can resist this transition, but that is one transition. One becomes more selfish right off the bat, which I'm not sure you expected as one of the things to be prepared for, but it is a distinct transition and practically everybody that I've seen, the moment they start getting a salary, our selfishness takes on new dimensions. In terms of the kinds of things that happen in a day-to-day -day life, you get treated much more brutally. Uh, most good bosses are not there to make you feel good. They're there to make sure that results get delivered. So uh, people don't politely say, maybe you should submit your homework. Uh, they will say, you are on a performance improvement plan. And if you don't get your shit together, you'll be fired in three months. So world becomes a lot more tough. Politics takes on a much bigger role where why are the best projects going to somebody who is not even capable becomes a very frequent question that you might never discover an answer to. And therefore one needs to figure out how to read into how organizations and people work. And by the way, you'll be surprised. And as you keep growing older, you will find that actually the most important problem in the world is politics. Uh, that is what controls all our destinies. If tomorrow Modi decides that they will make foreign investment legal in a certain sector, you find that everything changes there. Uh, 
and then comes the politics inside of corporations which namely so it comes down to people and people and people but when you begin with you will not be dealing with people you will be dealing with either technology or things like that and the journey of going from there to people centricity is probably the single biggest difference that you will see so you will very soon see that yes you are solving technical problems but it is the relationships and the politics behind it that are more important and that is probably the biggest transformation and how they tell me if uh, uh, if you have a very different perspective uh, on this it would be wonderful to get you've seen this as much as i have no it's it's a great answer ashish and i think it has really reinvigorated the audience there are quite a few comments now popping in especially hmm. to your comment on socialism versus capitalism and <laughs> good to good to see that okay so before we end ashish three very quick questions and you have to answer as fast as you can Gee. top three books you would recommend to the audience right now from your own top three books i am not a very literate guy uh, so top three books that i like one is uh, siddharth by herman hess another one is good to great by jim collins which talks about leadership i think leadership is one of the most important things in our lives uh and uh, the fourth one is is a, is a book which i find very entertaining which is uh, a gentleman from moscow it has got uh, the language is beautiful uh, by a guy called towels t o w l e s so these are the first three that came to mind uh, and in very three different areas yeah all right thanks for that uh, very quickly three companies we should closely watch out for something which is really inspiring or interesting things they are doing so there is uh, this is a very uh, hard to answer question and it will be biased so uh, there is one that i am on the board of called workspot it's in the us i think they are doing uh, they are doing amazing work uh, in in india what are some of the companies that i like i really like a company called neo n i y o which is not one of the helion companies uh, but i think they are uh, they are a very interesting company um, and by the way i don't know that many companies any longer because i'm not as well connected so we'll stop it too all right <laughs> okay and lastly on a lighter side your top 3 shows of netflix top 3 shows of netflix you know i don't watch netflix so oh. <laughs> uh, i can i can tell you some of the shows that i really like uh i'm not sure where they are one of them is called panchayat i think it's on uh, it's a- uh amazon prime i really like that show uh then uh i really liked the show which is done which was this uh, this couple uh, this uh, woman and man who run a wedding arrangement company uh i'm forgetting what it is called it's an older one maybe a year old uh, also on amazon prime and uh, to, 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 i'll if some one other one comes to mind i will i will tell you i really liked the first season of that uh, of the show in which uh, there is this guy who's in bombay and he plans to uh, nawazuddin siddiqui is the villain in that show and the policeman is a sadar ji Uh, and i can't remember a damn thing he's yeah. i think uh, it was sacred games sacred games but i like the first season but i thought the second season just went to hell in a hand basket <laughs> so about the first season i thoroughly enjoyed yeah <laughs> All right. i think a lot of people are going to spam your inbox with a lot of suggestions on the third question which is the top shows because clearly okay, wonderful your passion to be wide and there for sure <laughs> but i think i'll, I'll I'll end the session with this. Uh, Ashish, it'll be great, great if you can flash the last slide of your presentation so that people can see your email ID in case anybody wants to reach out to you. Uh, again, thank you, everyone, uh, especially the audience. You've been a great audience. The questions are still popping up. People are still giving you recommendations on the books and the companies and the shows. But I think we'll have to end it here. Thank you again. Thanks, everyone. It was a great session. Good to have Ashish. I'd also like to congratulate Punjab Engineering College for undertaking such a nice initiative, where they are bringing in distinguished people across the world to share their thoughts. Again, with this, 